Okay, so um, welcome. I'm Catherine Tyler. Um, I'm from UC Davis, and we're here this afternoon to talk about uh, wellness initiatives of Sorry, wellness initiatives of residency programs. Is it better? Okay. And uh, with me this afternoon are Christina Shenby and uh, Melissa Parsons and Kathy Lee and Jackie Tin and Jamin Patel and um, Corey. I've forgotten your last name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and um, so we're going to talk about some different things that different um, emergency medicine residency programs have been doing for wellness. Um, and I'm starting us off with uh, not another yoga class. And I, my disclosure is that I actually like yoga. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, but this photo is not actually me. Um, so when I was thinking about preparing for this talk, I really wanted to focus on sort of some of the physiological things that we tend to ignore in our busy training programs, both as we're residents and as faculty. And so I'm spending a lot of time down here at the bottom of the Maslow's Triangle. Um, and here we are updated for the 21st century, and I know that my battery life is currently pretty low at the moment, but my Wi-Fi is good. Um, but seriously, this sort of um, thinking was prompted by a study that was published towards the end of last year that focused on um, some of the needs of all healthcare workers, and it spent a lot of time talking about some of the basic things at the bottom, such that I'm hydrated, I have access to food and time to sleep, and some of those things, and it just made me think about how we often don't pay attention to those things at a sort of a basic level. So I'm sure everybody in this room has seen the Stanford um, circle. And I just like the interplay between the areas and that the emphasis is really on the organizational uh, factors and much less on the personal factors, but that there is a significant overplay between all of them. And I do really think that every single wellness issue has a component of personal resilience and physician efficiency and also a big culture of wellness component and how we deal with it in our departments. So I really missed an opportunity here because obviously the slide to put in here is a picture of the strip. <laughs> because everybody knows that the strip in Vegas is not wellness, it's like the antithesis of wellness. And actually most of wellness is really pretty boring. It's really paying a lot of attention to the basic understructure and um, things that help form your life. So in a residency program, the things that we really pay attention to are what does your shift structure look like? What does your rotation schedule look like? How do you honor your vacation requests? Um, how do you uh, treat driving and parking? Do you have a housing supplement if you're in a very expensive city? Some of those things that really help um, enhance the day-to-day well-being of residents. And the smaller things are more like what do you do for wellness activities and what is your individual shift request sort of look like? So very different than, it's not yoga classes. And one of the things, so I actually did a, a, a residency program in another country before I came here. And one of the things that really struck me when I was an intern here was how infantilizing the whole process was of being a resident and how much control you give up. You give up control of your finances, your schedule, a lot of your family life. Um, there's really a lot of things that you no longer have control over and that's super frustrating for people. And, and as a woman, it's often sort of timed sort of perfectly with your end of your fertile period. So there's fertility and infertility and when to have a pregnancy and whether or not to get pregnant. And then if you're pregnant, how you manage that and breastfeeding and all those things become a huge issue for women. And it's not that it's not important for men, but it's particularly an issue for women. One of the things that I like to think about when I'm talking about wellness is really taking back control of the things that you already have control over. So how you speak to yourself, who you follow, the boundaries that you set for yourself and for others, what you eat, when you ask for help, and your sleep routine. I think some of the best wellness programs in residency actually give control back to the residents in large and small ways. And for example, one of the things that we've recently done is the biannual mentor-mentee meetings, we've actually brought those back into the didactic um, time so that people don't have to find time to reschedule those. We do little minutes of exercise during our didactic um, curriculum and just in general try and give control back to people. 
I do think that there is a, a really important part of the personal resilience component, but it's because you have control over it. It's not because it's a huge part of wellness. It's because it's the only thing that you have direct control over and you can change it quickly. And one of the things that I think is important is to know what your own triggers are. So on my first day of a run of shifts, I'm really the nicest person. I'm so nice. I get people graham crackers. Would you like a blanket? And by the end of five shifts, I am no longer that same nice person. So being aware of what your own triggers are, I think, is um, important. So just briefly focusing on some of the physiologic needs in residency. Sleep is obviously very important. There's an amazing amount of literature that's not from healthcare about how important sleep is. And here's a big surprise. You make more cognitive mistakes the less sleep you have. Generally, it gets worse as you get older. Um, people who've done night shifts tend to be moodier and restless and crankier. This shouldn't be surprising to anybody in this room. Caffeine is sort of a substitute for sleep, and we all get by on it. One thing that I thought was really interesting when I was looking at this um, study was the link between sleep and depression. And so if you are a short sleeper, meaning you sleep less than six hours a night, and you are also a bad sleeper, meaning you're having very disrupted sleep, then your odds ratio for depression in residency is 4.2. Whereas if you can get some good quality sleep, even though you're still a short sleeper, you actually halve your depression risk. So this is one of the things where there's a real interplay between the personal component and also the um, system component in that you can take some control of getting good sleep for yourself. Food is obviously super important. Clearly, I'm not a woman who likes to miss a meal, get very hangry from time to time. Breaks are super important. One of the things I think that's great recently is that ASAP just said, hey, it's okay to eat and drink in the emergency department, and we've brought that back in. Um, so, and actually, the Joint Commission came by and didn't hate us. Um, vacations are good, but a mini vacation can also be super helpful. Driving is something that I think um, we're paying more attention to. Our um, graduate medic medical education will now reimburse residents for a lift ride home if they're fatigued after a night shift, and then they will also pay to come back um, to pick up your car later, which is um, very helpful. There's a stack load of information that suggests that your driving risks are markedly increased after 40 minutes of driving. So if you have a long commute, please be super careful. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Christina Shenby, and I'm going to talk about how to recognize and come back from burnout in no less than five to seven minutes. Working in the ER is hard, right? You all know this. It's not usually the big things. It's the little things that accumulate over and over and over and eventually break us. Not to be too melodramatic. This is an aorta. This is a grungy aorta. This is not the aorta you want. This aorta has had some rough times. It's sclerotic. It's crunchy. It's congealed. It's nasty. This is what happens to us as we experience burnout. We get atherosclerosis of the soul. We're no longer compliant and flexible and capable. We're now these grungy aortas. So how can you recognize if your poor resident is becoming a grungy aorta? Well, there are certainly quizzes and tests you can do, but what I find most helpful is to look for changes. Are they changing in their personality? Are they becoming angry, resentful? Do they have learned helplessness? This is so important. If you learn nothing else today, I want you to help protect yourself and your learners from learned helplessness. We're all basically just glorified rats. Rats can problem solve. They can go through mazes. If you put rats in environments where they are experiencing noxious stimuli and they have no control over it, they lose that ability to problem solve. They lose that ability to think creatively. We don't want to be those rats who have learned helplessness. If you notice behavioral changes, all of a sudden somebody is late all the time, not getting their paperwork on time, that's not a sign that you need to go scold that resident or colleague. That's a sign that you need to look underneath for signs of burnout. If they're withdrawing from their friends, if they're not doing their activities they used to do, if that small thing, that ultrasound they can't get at night, they get frustrated over and that becomes a huge thing, 
Those are all signs of burnout. Another sign is fatigue, physical fatigue, falling asleep all the time. Fortunately, most of you look okay today, but if you start to fall asleep at traffic lights, that's a sign of burnout. Mental fatigue, not being able to have the mental energy to think through problems, compassion fatigue. The third way to spot burnout is to look for unhealthy coping strategies, over drinking, overeating, binge watching mindless entertainment, withdrawing from your friends. These are signs that somebody is experiencing burnout. So how do you come back from burnout? Well, first, I want to talk about how you can change your mindset. This is not about external things. This is not about yoga. You experience burnout because of your thoughts. So first, look at the emotions. Stop trying to dampen those emotions with coping strategies and actually look at them. Maybe you're feeling frustration. You're frustrated at the staff, at the hospital system, at EMS because they did something. Frustrated at everything. Look under that frustration and anger. There's an anonymous saying, I sat with my anger long enough and she told me her real name was grief. Maybe underneath that anger, it's not actually anger. Maybe it's a sense of grief or betrayal or shame or inadequacy. Find those deeper feelings and then look for the thoughts behind them. You experience feelings not because of what's going on externally, but because of your thoughts. What is that thought that is driving that anger? Maybe the thought is, it shouldn't be this hard to admit a patient. It should be easier. And that thought cycles and spirals and spins in your head until you believe it and until it becomes so entrenched that it amplifies that anger and frustration. So let's look at that thought. This shouldn't be so hard. You don't have to completely transform your way of thinking all at once. What I want to give you to get out of that downward spiral is an upward ladder, a stepwise approach to change your thoughts to combat burnout. So when you experience that emotion of frustration or anger, first you're going to look for the underneath emotion, and then you're going to look for the thought behind that. And then take that thought and make a small change to it. For example, if your thought is, it should not be this hard to get an ultrasound at 2 a.m., change the thought to, this is hard. This is hard. And then next time when you have that thought, change the thought to, this is hard, but I can do hard things. And this may not work instantaneously, and it may be hard to apply in the moment, but if you start applying it in the calm times or teaching it to your residents, you can transform how you think. Take another example, anxiety. You've probably all experienced this. At 2 a.m., thoughts are racing through your head about, oh gosh, what did I do? Did I send that patient home? Should I have admitted them? Am I doing everything right? I haven't called my mom in three years. Is my dog still alive? Do I need to take the child to the vet? Oh, wait, maybe that's the dog. You have all these racing thoughts. So what can you do? First, you can download them. Write them down. That gets them out of your head and down on paper. And let me tell you, they look crazy when you start writing them down. You realize what's going on in your head and what you've been thinking, and you realize most of that doesn't even make sense if you write it down. And then you can do that same thing. Look for the thought behind your anxiety. Is the thought, I'm worried I'm not going to be a good enough doctor? Is the thought, I'm inadequate? Is the thought, Somebody's going to realize I don't deserve to be up on this stage. I don't know what I'm talking about. What is that underlying thought? And then find a way to change it in slow steps. Maybe the thought is, I'm not adequate as a doctor. And maybe you change that to, I'm working hard to be a good doctor. And then you change it to, I'm doing a good job learning how to be a doctor. And you slowly transform and climb your way out of that pit the, that the spiral of thoughts has landed you in. And this is an incredibly powerful way to start with yourself to combat burnout. The next thing that you can do is try to reclaim your agency. Remember those rats who lost their creativity in solving problem? It wasn't because they experienced the toxic environment, it was because they had no control or agency. So the first thing is to reclaim your agency internally. Let me tell you, residents, 
don't tell your program directors I told you this, but you don't have to go to work. Every single day, it is 100% your choice whether you go to work. Now, there will be some negative repercussions. You may get kicked out of your program, but it is always your choice to get up in the morning and go to work. And recognizing that can make you feel less like a helpless rat that has no control and more like a creative problem-solving rat. So take that for what it's worth. The third thing you can do is reclaim your agency not just internally but externally. Find ways to change the system. Get involved in committees. Get involved in your operations group. If it really frustrates you about that ultrasound at 2 a.m., find ways to change the system. Not only for yourself, this will help you develop a greater sense of agency in the world, but also for your future colleagues. Burnout is hard. Working in the ER is hard. But my friends, we can do hard things. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Parsons, and I'm APD at University of Florida Jacksonville. And I'm going to be talking to you about how we teach wellness in the residency programs. I mean, specifically the use of a flipped classroom curriculum. I have no financial disclosures. So for most of us in program leadership in GME, uh, me showing you the ACGME common program requirements probably doesn't instill a sense of well-being in you. But the ACGME in 2017 actually added some components to uh, the common program requirements that basically kind of said we need to be teaching some sort of wellness. And specifically what they wanted us to teach was that we need to be um, teaching residents to recognize burnout in themselves and in colleagues. Um, and in addition to burnout, also depression and substance abuse. And then we needed to be fostering a sense of um, self-care in residents. And so how do, we, how do we do that? So how are we teaching those things to our learners? And for a lot of us, I would guess it looks something like this, which ironic that I chose this photo because I could have taken a picture probably of this room, <laughs> right? But we're, we're giving a lot of lectures or we're organizing wellness events, right? And those yoga classes and things like that. But how is that moving the needle in teaching residents to take care of their personal resilience and their personal wellness? Um, and so we actually tried to utilize a flipped classroom approach. So our residents are given an kind of learning objectives um, and tools that they should prepare ahead of time before they come to conference. And then during conference, we're using small group learning to talk about these things. And so this is an example of what it looks like for us. So intellectual wellness, we talked about positive psychology. And instead of me telling them, standing up and saying, you know, this is Martin Seligman, this is positive psychology, these are all of these things and giving them statistics, they have a video um, and a couple of studies that they can look at on their own time. And then they have questions that they know they're gonna discuss when they come to conference. And so really what this allowed us to do was to let the learner have a little bit more control, take some of that agency back and say, these are things I'm really interested in. And they can come to conference and say, I think this is crap. They may. Um, but a lot of the times they really got interested in how can we apply this to what we're doing right now. Um, so like question four, how can positive psychology be applied in the emergency department? That question, like they ran wild with that one, right? What things can we do? How can we make some positive come out of rounds and the rounding process that we do? How can we give them positive feedback in a different way? How can they give each other positive feedback or reframe things with the nurses? And so what did we see come out of this, right? Instead of me standing up and telling the residents, here are statistics on mindfulness, or even worse, practicing mindfulness as a group of 45 people that did not go well at all, um, what we saw was the residents were coming together as PGY1s, PGY2s, and PGY3s combined into small groups and having discussions that I was learning stuff from. Um, my residents were convincing me I needed to try melatonin when we talked about sleep. We had a lawyer come in and um, actually depose one of our attendings in front of everybody and then talked about the stress that comes with um, being involved in a lawsuit. 
but the residents and their conversations were actually enlightening to the faculty that were involved and to each other. Um, and we saw really good collaboration between the residents. So then comes the question of, did we improve something, right? And we didn't ever set out to measure burnout scores and see whether or not we were improving resident wellness, because the point wasn't to improve that. Like, that's a system change. The point was, are we teaching our residents something that when they do experience burnout, and when they have those five shifts in a row, that they can recognize something in themselves and make adjustments. Um, and so what we did find is that, first of all, I have uh, 45 residents. I had residents, A, actually answer a survey after a didactic, which at my shop is like a feat in and of itself. Um, and we had really positive results about when you asked them, was this an educational, uh, meaningful educational opportunity for you? Um, and we, it was almost all positive, 88% on some, up to 99% on some of the different uh, sessions that we did. So I think it's an innovative way to start talking about wellness in small groups instead of trying to set up yoga classes or instead of giving these large lectures. Um, because certainly our residents are old enough, they're advanced learners. If they want to do yoga, they can also just set up their own yoga classes, right? But being able to have these discussions as adults and really letting them kind of shape the conversation um, was something new and different for us. Oh. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Kathy Lee. I'm a fourth year resident at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And I, for this not another yoga class talk, wanted to talk about kind of what exactly are the costs of resident burnout. We all know kind of the personal, emotional toll it can take on individuals, but really what does it cost the system? What data can we use to try to get hospitals, employers, the system more invested in physician well-being? So I have no financial disclosures, except that I spent a lot of money on medical school and training. Um, so there's obviously the individual costs of uh, medical training, you know, what any resident has paid to earn their medical degree and become a board certified physician, um, which I added up and costs about over $250,000 if you didn't do a post back program. Um, there's also the systemic costs. It costs the government every year about $15 billion uh, to train residents across the country, which averages out to about $110,000 per resident per year as of last year. And uh, some studies have actually estimated that it costs hospitals, so, so hospitals are paid this money, and, but it actually costs hospitals uh, an estimated $180,000 to $200,000 to train these residents. Um, there's also the effect on patient care of, resi uh, of burned out residents. So, um, you know, burned out individuals have uh, decreased productivity. They, they may practice to a lower standard of care. They obviously pro provide care that is perceived at a lower quality, maybe because of the attitude um, that they portray to towards patients. Um, they are more likely to commit medical error. They uh, are more likely to be named in a malpractice lawsuit. And, and then they also have increased turnover uh, once they graduate by, um, you know, at, at employers. Uh, and it's estimated that it costs about 150 to $200,000 for employers to go out and recruit and hire and credential another physician. So all of these costs are hard to, you know, add up. It's not as easy as it's straightforward as the resident and um, individual costs, but all of these definitely have a financial burden. Um, the other th thing is that uh, the IHI triple aim um, of kind of providing the best care for the most people at the lowest cost um, was a concept that was introduced several years ago, but a flaw that people have found with this uh, model is that under, it assumes the, uh, uh, kind of workforce well-being, and people have found that employee burnout 
jeopardizes the success of this triple aim. So it's really, the system really needs to be invested in physicians and staff well-being in order to achieve this triple aim. So a couple of solutions. Um, I like the model of that that's now being more recently adopted of incorporating care team well-being into a quadruple aim to value it as equal as patient experience and population health and lowering healthcare costs. Um, and a couple of, you know, there, there aren't very many studied solutions to kind of systemic uh, ways to improve care team well-being, but a few of them are, you know, shared team documentation notes to reduce redundancy in charting um, and hopefully to allow people to spend less time in front of the computer, the use of scribes, uh, employing more circadian shift scheduling, and then more recently, as Kat already mentioned, um, having food and beverage stations in the emergency room uh, where physicians you know, can both work and maintain their, their, fulfill those very basic needs, um, and then also providing healthy food options on shift. Um, we'll do a few, we'll, we'll soon do some idea shares for a few more strategies, but uh, really wanted to highlight just kind of the cost to the system and, and how to hopefully advocate for more systemic change. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I am Jackie Tin. I'm one of the EM residents at Mount Sinai in New York, and I will be talking about facing imposter syndrome. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so understanding imposter syndrome is the key to beating it. Um, a lot of us, so understanding imposter syndrome, it was first in 1978 that two psychologists described the sensation that, um, the feeling that um, all your success, successes are due to being lucky, um, and um, sorry, one second, lost my notes. Um, that you're feeling lucky, and that um, you have no inner sense of your abilities, um, and that you are in constant fear that you're, someone's going to figure you out. Um, this gives you um, a con if this goes in a cycle, um, it, this can contribute to. Uh, depression, anxiety, lack of self-confidence, as well as um, burnout. So for this reason, um, in order to conquer imposter syndrome, we need to understand it. Number one, stop comparing yourself to other people. Um, there will always be someone more accomplished, more intelligent, more prolific, more fit. Um, stop this. Um, just because they're awesome, that doesn't mean that you can't be awesome as well. Number two, stop shitting yourself. Um, in the little free time that you have as a resident, as a med student, as faculty, you don't want to spend that time um, complaining, saying that you should have been on more hospital committees, that you should have um, spent your vacation reading the rest of Rosen's, that um, during your last shift you should have spent all of lunch um, seeing more and more patients. Stop shitting yourself unless you have a good reason or else flush that down the toilet. When you do have an automatic negative thought, um, stop it. Whenever someone compliments you, make sure you say thank you. Um, the next time someone compliments you on a good job, um, and you hear yourself saying, oh, um, I only had the opportunity to do so because I was the only one brainstorming and there were no other people involved, stop yourself when you hear yourself thinking those thoughts and counter counteract it. Um, when we do feel, um, when everyone ha has imposter syndrome, you feel um, a sense of decreased uh, confidence. So if you want something, always say that you, um, you project it. Stop trying to be the perfectly pristine perfectionist. No one is perfect. You will never, um, your mentors are never perfect. So um, stop being a perfectionist. Um, balance is key. Imposter syndrome um, helps you um, become grounded and become a, a better physician. But it be if it becomes overbalanced and you have a decreased uh, sense of self-worth, 
um, that is when you run the dangers of imposter syndrome. Um, but remember that you're never alone. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Jamie Patel. I'm one of the uh, chief residents at UC Davis. So we're, I'm gonna kick off the idea share portion of our talk. Um, so I only have one slide. Um, so basically we, during this portion of our talk, we'll just talk about things we've done at our own residency programs in terms of uh, resident wellness and how they've worked. For me, that, uh, that program is chief check-in. Um, so for full disclosure, this idea was given to me by Hunter Patterson, who's sitting right over there, um, who's one of our incoming chiefs. So not my idea, uh, but basically the basic tenet is that we have didactics every Tuesday, um, almost every Tuesday, and about once every quarter at the end of didactics, we have a 30-minute session where we have all of the faculty, no offense to the three faculty members that are here, leave, um, and just have residents there, and we talk about things that the residents want to talk about. There's no agenda or anything. We sit everyone down and are like, all right, what do you want to talk about? And the residents are free to say basically whatever they want to say. Um, and believe it or not, it's not all complaints. Like we ac actually have people that say positive things about things that are changing the department, but obviously there are some things we talk about that are negatives and we talk through them. Um, and we as chiefs then take all this information. A lot of it actually isn't really actionable. You know, it's sort of like allowing the person to say this kind of sucks and you kind of end it there and that's an okay end point for some things, but other things are actionable. We take those uh, small points and we sort of compile them as chiefs and then we go to our program leadership and we're like, hey, you know, we met with the residents and these are the three things that we are concerned about. What can we do about them? And we make an effort to close the loop the next time around and say, okay, this is what we're doing about what we talked about last time. Um, I think that this idea has a couple of unique advantages. Number one is that it has a very low activation energy. I feel like any program can do this. You all have chief residents, um, you all have didactics, and it, we have it so that our, our next shift after our didactics doesn't start for at least an hour and a half, so we have a pretty good window there after our didactics end to get everyone together to talk about these kind of things, and all you need to do is give them a space and a time and have the chief residents lead it, and I feel like it's a pretty low, as I said, activation energy and a pretty high yield. Number two, and we've already talked about this a little bit on Katrin's slide, is that like the idea that wellness is, uh, sorry, the idea that burnout is a loss of control. This does give some control back to the residents in terms of giving them the empowerment to actually shout out some ideas or gripes that they might have without fear of repercussions or anything like that. Uh, and then also, it's, it's actually surprising because you hear, when we've done these things, um, you kind of hear things that uh, are, you know, like scheduling and like some of the other common gripes that are like universal throughout residency programs, but also you hear some things that are surprising that actually, you know, I had never thought of. And so, you know, you can't really fix a problem if you don't know it exists. So at least it identifies problems that um, are there that maybe are a little bit harder to identify unless you're one of the residents that's sitting there. Um, and yeah, that's really kind of it. Cool. Yeah. All right. I thought we were going to be sitting down for this portion, but I have to click this. Um, so uh, our idea share from Mount Sinai that, that we came up with in the last year and a half or so uh, that I want to talk about is uh, resident shout outs. And so that it essentially is during conference, especially like between speakers, sometimes we have like five, 10 minute gap and we just say it's time for shout outs and anyone can shout out anything for, about someone else or yourself. Um, but it's like, you know, this intern just did their first central line. They did a great job. Someone had a champagne tap. Someone ran a great code the other day. Um, it's just a nice way, I think, because we have a pretty large residency and, and sometimes you don't hear about all the fun things that other people have done. Um, it's a nice way to just foster kind of camaraderie and um, build confidence and uh, also just hear about like cool stories that, that people have done. So that's my little idea share.
Hunter. Uh, my name is Corey Cluxton. I'm one of the PGY2 residents at UF Jacksonville. And for our idea share, um, we have a lot of things that we do for wellness, but one of them in particular that I think has gone really well at our program is a class day off. Um, basically, once per block, um, we either have the first years, the second years, or the third years all have a class day off to, um, together. It's kind of a hassle for our schedule and stuff like that, but it's doable, especially like on the front end. And I think it really helps us out um, building that kind of class connection, especially with your um, fellow uh, co-residents. Uh, I think it was one moment in my intern year, um, and we were about three or four months into residency, and at least at our program, we don't have like an orientation month or anything like that. And uh, one of the third years turned to me and was like, oh, how do you like your co-interns? I was like, well, half of them are on off-service rotation, so I don't get to see them. And then the other ones, um, when you're on shift, you're always scheduled with the senior. And so I didn't really ever get to hang out too much with my fellow co-interns. Um, and this class day off has really allowed us to do that. Um, we actually get a budget from our department as well. And we're a county hospital, so that money's coming from somewhere. Um, and um, Basically, I think one day like we went go-karting together, the other day like we had a beach day off. Um, it's really a good opportunity for all the residents to get together. It's not forced or anything, it's not mandatory. Um, I don't think wellness should be mandatory. Um, so there are people that choose to stay at home, um, but that's their choice and that's their, how they're celebrating their wellness. Um, but I think it's something that really helped us um, build relationships like among the classes themselves and it gives you a lot of people to like lean on when you're sharing those same frustrations. And it seems like the frustrations almost go year after year. Like the interns have the same frustrations as the other interns and the second years have the same frustrations because they're in different roles. Um, and that was about it. Thank you. Um, my idea share was uh, resident families. At Sinai in New York, we have um, a huge um, amount of residents. We have about 80 in the four classes. Um, and with resident families, we've been having this for maybe five to 10 years now, where it's comprised of two, one to two faculty as our moms and dads. Um, and then we have one or two residents in each year. And then with these resident families, we're housed within bigger houses, um, and we call ourselves like House Haldol, um, House like Sucks and Acoline, they're really cute. Um, so those, um, with these house uh, families, we get to um, hang out with each other once or twice um, every month. Sometimes it really depends. So the pros of this is we have uh, these families, um, and we have an opportunity to bond closer with the seniors above us or our juniors, um, and have them as mentors. Um, but the con really is, this is really flexible, so um, it depends on your attendings, the faculty, the residents, and um, our schedules. So um, a lot of our families, like my family, we're really um, active. We tend to meet up with each other once um, every month to you know, hang out in one of our um, residents' apartments, um, just play board games, cook together. Um, they're really fun, but on the pro, uh, con side, a lot of my other colleagues, um, their families barely meet. Um, so there isn't um, an infrastructure for every family to be the same, but I think it potentially has um, a lot of, um, I guess, power in terms of um, getting to know each other, starting as an intern, you don't know your co-interns, you don't know anyone above you. Um, so this really connects you to um, a smaller group within your bigger resident family. Thank you. So that's actually the end of our formal schedule. Um, we are 10 minutes ahead of time. Um, I'm going to, we're all going to get off the podium and if you would like to ask us any questions, we would be more than happy to answer them um, or if you have any suggestions, but I'm thinking you probably all have better things to do in Vegas. 